Thanks for joining us for this archive of Teaching American History's Saturday webinar for Saturday, March 6, 2021. Focus of today's program was Susan B. Anthony. We were joined by Dr. Chris Burkett of Ashland University, Dr. Will Otto of the University of Dallas, and Dr. Lauren Hall of the Rochester Institute of Technology. Okay, looks like everybody's in. Good. Well, uh, welcome. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another Teaching American History dot org Saturday webinar uh, sponsored by the Ashbrook Center at Ashland University. TAH.org is the leading online resource for the documents-based study of American history, government, and civics for teachers, students, and citizens. I'm Chris Burkett, uh, Associate Professor of Political Science here at Ashland University. Um, in case you're joining us for the first time, the theme of our webinar is the spring semester is Remember the Ladies. And uh, the point is to bring together some thoughtful scholars and some interesting, lively thinkers uh, to have a conversation about uh, various ladies uh, this semester. And I encourage all of you to join us in that conversation by submitting questions via the Q&A function, uh, not the chat function, but the Q&A function. And uh, we will try to get to as many of those questions as possible. In the next week, you'll receive an email with a link to request a certificate of participation as well as a link to the archived video and audio from today's conversation. So today we're talking about Susan B. Anthony, and I'm very happy to introduce our panelists today, uh, Dr. Lauren Hall of Rochester Institute of Technology, and Dr. Will Addo of the University of Dallas. So thank you both very much for being here this morning. Um, so I'm, gonna, I'm just going to start with a broad observation about things. So I, I, when I think of... Um, uh, uh, leaders of the women's suffrage movement or women equal rights for women. I mean, Susan B. Anthony to me is the one that I always remember. And I think maybe the most well-known in the minds of most Americans. I mean, I remember maybe it's because of the new, the dollars that came out. When was that? The late seventies or eighties, the Susan B. Anthony dollars when I was a kid. Uh, and I, you know, well, who, who's Susan B. Anthony? And that's how I think I learned about her. But, um, but why, why is it? Why do you think it that I think she's usually the first person or often the first person people think of when they think of uh, suffrage for women? What, in other words, what, why is, what has contributed to her lasting memory and presence in the American mind? I can Anybody want to start? Please. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I can Thank jump you, in and then see what, see what Will has to say. Um, I mean, I think I think there's two things. Um, one is that she was she was active for so long, right? So she has this, you know, really um, 50 year period of intense activity um, that spans the one of the most important eras of of American history, right? So she really starts sort of um, she gets interested in activism before the Civil War, and then you know her her legacy continues into um, until her death in 1906, if I'm remembering correctly. So it's just a huge span of of years. Uh, the other the contributing factor, um, she was also one of the most active. I mean, she spanned the United States. She traveled an enormous amount, so she was much more um, flexible in part because she wasn't married, she didn't have family. And so it was easier for her to kind of be the face of the movement than it was for someone like Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who had children, um, and a family. Uh, and then the other thing is that she, she and Stanton wrote one of the most comprehensive histories of the feminist movement of the suffrage, uh, movement. Um, and there's been a lot of criticism about whether they, you know, sort of uh, overlooked the, uh, you know, whether they gave themselves sort of pride of place and overlooked the contributions of other thinkers. Um, but the fact that they were, that they had this incredible eight volume, I think, um, history of, of the women's movement in the United States, uh, that was the legacy that, that historians had to work from. Yeah, I would just add to that, first of all, just to agree with what Lauren said there, but also um, in terms of I mean, I kind of see it on two levels in terms of the longevity here. One sort of the popular imagination in the way that people, you know, you teach Civil War, um, you know, it's always Gettysburg, huh? and it, and that's great. But you know, that that's what's sort of put out there uh, in the sort of public space. Um, so people think of whether the coins or Susan B. Anthony list or something that's associated with her name. That is what I think to people sort of have a grasp of. But on the other hand. Uh, you know, the, the just sheer, the prodigious 
effort on her part over such a sustained period is pretty breathtaking. I mean, she's just ubiquitous. She is all over the place giving speeches constantly, just sort of indefatigable. And I'm not saying, you know, obviously that um, Stanton or somebody uh, uh, isn't Elizabeth Cady Stanton, but um, just the just the, the sheer um, uh, effort there. Um, and of course, the, the very uh, blunt, plain spoken um, I'm willing to get arrested for this. I get arrested for this. Um, I think, you know, that she, you know, that sort of sticks uh, in, in the, the sort of long-term popular imagination. And I don't know exactly when it was, but as I was kind of perusing around some sources and it was unbeknownst to me, but she had been received a presidential pardon uh, of late for her 18, whatever it was, 72 arrests. So yeah, I, I contribute a lot to just the sheer energy and the, you know, the sort of the magnitude of what she's, um, you know, doing for such a long period of time. That's great. Thank you. Uh, so, so, by the way, just a quick question. Can you see the questions or do it? Or, yes. Or can you, okay, you can see I them. I can, okay, yeah. Good. So, what was she, what was she arrested for? The, the pardon? Does anybody know? What was? She was arrested for voting in Rochester. Oh, she, York, okay, that's, okay, hometown. that's what yep. that's. Okay. And I think they actually, I think the Susan B. Anthony um, Foundation, uh, I'm not sure how this all worked, but I think they rejected the pardon on her behalf, uh, essentially saying that that it would legitimize <laughs> the process. Uh, and so from their perspective, in, in the same way that she she was, she lost the case, I think it was United States v. Anthony, she lost the case, was fined $100 and said, I will not pay that fine. Um, and rather than holding her in contempt, the judge just basically said, fine. <laughs> so, I don't, I don't want to deal with this anymore. <laughs> that's, that's great. Yeah. So yeah, I guess that's a great point. I hadn't thought of that, but if they had accepted the pardon, it would have been, yeah, it would have been like saying she'd actually done something wrong in terms yep. of, in terms of acting unjustly. It may have been illegal, but it wasn't unjust. Okay. Yeah. Perhaps. Good. That's great. Um, so you mentioned about, uh, you know, her, uh, both of you have sort of brought up aspects of her personality. So what was she like? What was her personality like? I've heard she was gruff at times. Um, is that is that true? She said there's a kind of bluntness about her. How, how, how did her personality affect her achievements or did it become a, an impediment to her, uh, an impediment, sorry, to her achievements? Well, I'll say something up front here real quick and then let Lauren weigh in on it. I can best speak to her in terms of more sort of her prose and an academic sense and what you get in terms of, you know, sort of, you know, what she does officially. Um, so I'm not trying to, uh, you know, sort of speak to her in a personal way in that instance, but I don't, you know, it's not someone who really suffered fools very gladly, I think, in terms of the argument that she made. I mean, as you go through these readings, one of the things that's always very striking to students is, you know, I will prove to you, you know, I will prove to you, right? I mean, I'm going to set it out here. And I'm just reminded, for example, of the argument that she made with respect to, I mean, she's starting at 17 years of age, uh, making very, you know, clear, cogent arguments at 17 about, about the necessity of being paid on an equal basis um, for what she's doing as a teacher. And, she, you know, sort of the, uh, one, one of the things that stuck with me from graduate school was the, um, the episode of her telling these men who were complaining about, do you realize that, you know, by virtue of how you handle the situation, you are essentially admitting to your own stupidity. If you can't, if you can't accord this kind of status, uh, and you say, well, women, are, well, you know, they, they nurture, they educate, there's sort of a natural aspect there. And then you go and circumscribe it uh, and, and sort of minimize it that, you, you know what man is going to join that now you join if you, you were to join this profession you make yourself a fool right um so i always kind of took that as a little bit of a sort of sense of and just the overall rhetoric i mean she's kind of oh, she's almost garrisonian sometimes in the way she uh, writes and speaks about things so i take that and it's sort of her public persona as being very um I'm not going to say necessarily combative, but, um, you know, she's on a mission and, you know, she's, she sort of hits you where you live and not going to waste time. Yeah. yeah it's, also, it's also important to remember, too, that, that a lot of her, because of her close relationship with Elizabeth Cady Stanton, um, who is often considered the sort of intellectual of the two, right? Uh, Anthony was the, 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 
powerhouse. She was the public face. Uh, and then Stanton did a lot of, of the writing. And Stanton actually says at one point, she says, uh, I forged the Thunderbolts and Anthony fired them, All right? So this was the kind of relationship between the women um, and the fact that you have this incredibly strong, fierce sort of public presence that, um, that was Anthony, um, who as, as um, Professor Otto points out, she had been actually earning her living um, after she uh, stopped teaching most of her living came from her public speaking. So she had been doing this for a very, very long time. Um, and so she absolutely had that, that kind of combination of fierceness and directness um, and definitely did not suffer fools. And she was also, and this kind of addresses some of the questions in the Q and A, um, she was also willing to work with people that um, in a way that people of different, uh, she had a kind of intensity of purpose that meant that she was willing to work with almost anyone who was willing to help her in her cause. And that's opened her up to a lot of criticism um, more recently, questions of um, you know, racism, questions of whether she worked with um, you know, people who, uh, who she simply should not have worked with at all. Uh, she took money from people that, uh, that held pretty seriously racist views. And so I think that's part of what is, uh, you know, that there's been sort of questioning of her legacy. And, and we can go into that in more detail later because I have some thoughts on that. But I think as part of her public project, she was an organizer. And so she was willing to work with anybody who was able to and, and willing to help her get to her, her end goal. No, that's great, thank you. Yeah, uh, by the way, Janet asked, would we be talking about her personality if she was a man? Uh, I mean, yes, we would be. Uh, we'd be talking about personalities of males too, but that was kind of the point of my question was this, this, per, this sort of lingering image of her as being gruff and rough and direct and blunt. I think that persists because of the fact that it was considered by men at the time to be uh, what a, a quality that was not uh, flattering to a woman or something, however you want to put it, right? So th I, that was my point in asking the question was um, uh, the, the fact that, um, you know, a man with the same kind of personality would have been given a pass perhaps, right? But this was yeah. this was very different for uh, a, a part of the different standards that applied for uh, for women at the time, so. And if I, if I can add quickly to that, Chris, I mean, one, one thing I remember from just learning about Anthony, even in even in elementary school and middle school, high school, was you know she was kind of gruff and um, you know non maternal. She never got married. She never had children. Right. So there was this kind of like she was you know fierce and kind of strict and upright and not you know sort of womanly in the traditional sense. Um, and it turns out that a lot of that was actually not accurate. Um, she loved children. She actually helped raise uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton's children. They had a very close friendship and she would watch Elizabeth Cady Stanton's children in order so that she could write. Um, and she had nieces who she was very, very close with. And then she did an enormous amount of mentoring within the women's movement uh, toward the end of her life in order to make sure, and she called those women her nieces, uh, and tried to move the, the sort of, you know, mentor young women to, to pick up the, the movement moving forward. So this idea of her as being sort of, I mean, I think there's this, this bucket that we do want to put female historical figures into, right? That, that if you're an activist and you don't have children, you're sort of this like non-maternal kind of character. And really she was, she was a very complex woman, but you know, there's no evidence that she didn't like children or <laughs> didn't, you know, uh, she was, yeah complex and she loved the people. I mean, she had these deep abiding friendships with many, many people, including um, uh, Katie Stanton. I mean, maybe that's also in part because of the fact that, I think of fact that most of most of history has been written by men, <laughs> right? Until, it, until it, up to a certain point in the 20th century, but still even after that, but yeah, so. Yeah, that's very interesting. Uh, so we have a number of great questions coming in and now I'm trying to figure out where do we start? <laughs> based on the points that both of you have raised so far. So you mentioned, uh, Lauren, uh, you know, the, the, her reputation today uh, in a kind of controversial way. Henry actually asked earlier, was, was Susan B. Anthony a racist? And if so, did that have anything, you know, how did that tie into, sorry, her Quaker background? And then uh, connected to that, there's another question from, um, oh, Linda, who asked, where did her powerful views of, of women's suffrage and abolition come from? Did she have mentors that modeled her, that she modeled her life after? So I guess I'm wondering, 
what inspired her to be uh, such an outspoken, um, uh, you know, voice uh, with regard to both abolition and uh, voting rights for women? Yeah, I'll say up front, just very quickly, um, one of the things that I think was uh, influential, obviously, was her own, um, was her Quaker upbringing. I mean, her um, um, mother and father both, um, you know, she talks about this um, uh, often enough, I don't know, 16 years of age, 17 years of age. Um, I'm just remembering one specific instance where she referenced her father explaining to her the laws as they applied or didn't apply, as the case may be, to women and what a profound effect that had on her in terms of having her father explain to her, this is the situation in terms of your ability or your inability to either teach or to be paid or to have, you know, a sort of equivalent standard applied to you. And of course, obviously the answers in these instances would have been in the negative uh, that, you know, that those things aren't happening. Um, and, you know, there's, I, I think you, you look, look at Seneca Falls or something, look at the number of, you know, Quaker, you know, there's a huge Quaker influence here already. Um, and so, I, I think it's kind of a combination of that up, upbringing, the background. Uh, you can look at um, sort of the core idealism of Quaker beliefs and say, I think there was always, even if Philadelphia didn't necessarily go William Penn's direction, you know, there's always this retaining of that kind of idealism of a kind of equality. Um, and, you know, I, and she, clearly she had parents who engaged her, uh, and Lauren may speak to this in terms of you know, either that or some outside of her immediate family, of which I think there were a number, but, um, you know, uh, part of the stress here was on the uh, influence that um, especially mothers have, but I think in her instance, her case, um, bo both parents, I think there was substantial parental influence, and, um, and, and I think clearly you had somebody who was, um, um, I mean, there's, there's something here personal about her in terms of ability and drive and determination that um, not everybody is possessed of. Uh, so clearly, um, you know, something that became a mission, if you will, um, early on. Yeah, and just to add to that, um, her, a lot of her siblings, I think she was, um, she had seven, there were seven children total. Um, and many of her siblings went on to do to, to work as social reformers. So I think two of her brothers end up in Kansas doing anti-slavery work. So she came from a family of, of deep, um, deeply uh, thoughtful and concerned citizens. And she actually makes the, the comment about, um, so her, her sort of, she's well known primarily, although actually someone in the Q&A said that they had actually learned about her primarily as an abolitionist, but uh, I had primarily learned about her as a, as a suffragette, right? The, her focus was women's issues. Uh, but she says at one point when she's in the process of shifting into abolition work, um, she says, this is clearly the most important work, right? The, the, the concern that I have for the, the sort of skills that I built in the women's movement I'm applying to a much more important task. So, so prior to the Civil War, she really sees abolition as the the crucial social problem of the time. Um, and that doesn't mean that the other that the women's issues that she's that she's looking at things like equal pay, things like divorce laws, the fact that women couldn't own property or or sign contracts, for example, uh, those were serious problems. But in the face of slavery. Uh, as it was going on, I think she was very clear that that is the primary social evil, and she wanted to use her her um, her talents in that direction. And then, of course, after the Civil War, things change, right? The social landscape changes, and her goals change as a reformer. Yeah, Lord, you mentioned this uh, that one of the comments or Q and A statements there was about um, knowing, sort of knowing about Susan B. Anthony principally as abolitionist. Um, uh, and part of it, of course, is going to be some, you know, what, what is your own kind of personal preparation or uh, a course that you take or what kind of emphasis is given. Um, but this is someone who was involved in reform, um, you know, pretty, pretty, pretty widespread, um, broad, broadly speaking, your temperance, uh, abolition, suffrage, um, you know, there's uh, even some um, 
you know, interest, considerable interest ultimately, I think, and things like penal reform, um, things of that nature. Um, she's familiar with um, a real cross section of reformers, uh, and and obviously, I think as as Lauren points out here, that you know, there's some, something that has pride of place is abolition, right? Uh, there's always a lot made of this idea of uh, you know, sort of Susan B. Anthony as um, I'm not going to support black suffrage uh, if uh, women's suffrage isn't isn't part of it. Uh, and so, sometimes I think that that you know there's how shall I say maybe a, a in my in my view anyway kind of a mistaken um, de-emphasizing uh, of what I think Lauren is pointing out here, and that is that um, she understood. Um, abolition to be the most pressing um, issue. Um, if you couldn't, if you couldn't resolve that, if you couldn't solve that, I mean, you know, you got to do sort of these documents. The very first one, when I say there's, she strikes a sort of Garrisonian note. I mean, she, you know, he he isn't going to come in here for criticism. I mean, she's no respecter of person. It reminds me a lot of Frederick Douglass on his, you know, what to the slaves of the Fourth of July. You're going to celebrate this, but I'm about to turn all this on its head. Um, so I kind of see her, even if it's not the, uh, I, I don't, I want to give short shrift to some of these early reform movements, but, you know, sort of temperance, I mean, she's kind of warming up in terms of the rhetoric there. By the time she gets to the slavery issue, it's um, sort of full, full blown, you know, the Constitution, I have no truck with a document that, you know, Washington, Jefferson, I mean, even the even you know uh, Joshua Giddings or Charles Sumner, you know, you know, duly noted that they made these tremendous sacrifices and you know the abuse and so on and so forth by these slaveholding powers. You know, even they come in for it. So she, um, the last thing I want to do is sort of make it sound like she's some sort of dabbler in reform. What I'm saying is that she's very much a part um, of the sort of breadth and depth of the reform movement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very but, thoughtful. I'm sorry. Go ahead, please, Lauren. I'm sorry. Um, well, I was just going to jump off that um, uh, Will's point and look at some of the because a couple of people have asked this mm -hmm. question of you know whether she's whether she's a racist, right? What what is her attitude toward the the Reconstruction Amendments and I think it's really important for students to, to understand, you know, how complicated the political and the reform movement is at this time. So I think we kind of think that like there's these people who, you know, like everyone sort of was on the same page when it came to political and social reforms, like moving into the progressive era. But really there was enormous controversies within the reform movement itself. So um, one of the big problems that, that Anthony faced very early on is that a lot of the abolitionists um, were very concerned about, and this was true in the temperance movement too, the, those often tended to be so more socially conservative movements in some ways, um, which we're sort of surprised about, but they were very uncomfortable with the concept of, of making divorce easier. So giving women the opportunity to get out of abusive marriages, for example. And so that was something that, that Anthony saw as absolutely necessary to any kind of, of social reform is giving people the opportunity to get out of abusive marriages. But the concept of marriage was still very much, uh, it, it had enormous religious implications. It had a great deep weight within, um, within many of these religious communities, of course. And a lot of these religious communities are where the abolitionists are coming from. So the idea that there's, that there's sort of this, just everyone's on the same page when it comes to what progress looks like or what reform looks like really there's deep rifts within the movement and so we see that early on with the abolitionists not quite being sort of on board with a lot of the goals of the of the women's movement um and then of course that becomes really clear when when um after the civil war when you start looking at the the 15th amendment and how that is going to um how that's going to be structured and so Anthony's, um, her resistance was not that she didn't want black men to have the vote unless women could have it too. Her concern was actually a much more nuanced one, which I, it sort of boggles the mind that people aren't paying adequate attention to it. But her concern is you're also leaving out black women, right? And so the idea that, that she, she's actually making what you could almost call a sort of intersectional argument. Um, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton makes this clear in some of her other speeches that actually become much maligned um, for the use of some some 
problematic language, certainly by our standards. Um, but the idea is you have all of these, these folks, um, especially they were looking at immigrants, for example, coming from Ireland and, um, and other places with more sort of patriarchal kinds of understandings of, of uh, relations between the sexes. And Anthony's concern was, well, wait a second, you give men the right to vote, and then you, you continue to place women under these men's heels. Um, and on top of that, you have, there's this there's this sort of justice question of many men throughout the South, particularly newly uh, freed people uh, who have no formal education, they have no, right, and, and so you're, there's a merit question, right, of why we're giving all of these people with no educational background the right to vote, but women with college educations can't vote, right, women with, with very, you know, like her and Susan B. Ann, or, um, her and Katie Stanton. So it's a more nuanced question than simply, we don't want you to have the vote un until we get it. Um, and both she and, and Stanton were very concerned that if the, if the 15th Amendment goes through and introduces the term man for the first time in the Constitution, right, this is crucial to remember too, the Constitution doesn't talk about sex or gender until that, uh, until that amendment. That if we introduce that, you know, K uh, Katie Stanton says, you're not going to get, we're not going to get the, the vote for another 100 years. And she was it was 50 years, so she wasn't wrong. So it was a much, much more complicated situation than just she doesn't want Black men to vote. That was never her position at all. Hmm. That's fascinating. Yeah, very complicated. <laughs> um, well, thank you for think helping us think that through or at least see the complications of that issue. So um, we had another uh, number of questions on that and also her relationship with other abolitionists. Um, as I think both of you were slightly, you know, were brought up earlier, right? So can you tell us about um, how, how did, how did uh, sort of what was her role among abolitionists? Uh, uh, was, was she respected by other abolitionists? Um, how, well, how well known was she as an abolitionist, perhaps is a better way to put that. Um, and then I'm interested in pursuing this question that Will brought up earlier as well. Is she more like a Frederick Douglass abolitionist or a William Lloyd Garrison abolitionist? Did she have correspondence and relationship with, with, with relationships with these guys? Uh, and then how do the readings reveal then? Uh, because I think we have two documents really focusing on our abolitionist thought. How do those documents, uh, what can we point teachers to or students to, to, to get a real sense of where her abolitionism, abolitionism is coming from? That was a long-winded question or series of questions, sorry. <laughs> yeah, um, oh. I, I, in, in my... Um middle-aged status here, I'm going to remember the, as best I can, Chris, you may have to help an old person along here. Um, uh, but I'm thinking of, uh, you know, particularly your question about the sort of what, what kind of abolitionist and what about these documents there. Um, and, uh, you know, students, my, my students anyway at Dallas usually talk about um, if you sort of consider a range, you know, sort of like the range that we have here, um, it's pretty unmistakable, uh, you know, up front, this 1861 selection and the 1863 even. Um, that, and that's why I said sort of that they're at least, and again, I'm, I'm going based on how I think the sort of the first blush is usually at some of these, that there is a very kind of Garrisonian-like um, uh, sense there, right? I mean, she, uh, you know, as I said, the, the the, um, the the Supreme Court is you know all these national institutions are failing us. The court is you know, the court is failing us. Um, all these people who mean well, nonetheless, will um, um, you know revere, abide by, um, you know express that when they are directly asked uh, that yes, the Constitution is the law of the land, and there's much more sort of the how can you accept it as the law of the land? And, and, I'll, um, and uh, you know, we have some interesting debates in class. Is she just being, is this just uh, to sort of, uh, you know, prime the pump and get people to think about the actual constitution and what it isn't ultimately accomplishing? Because, you know, they, they, they read also Frederick Douglass and, and they're at least familiar with Douglass sort of saying, hey, you know, to those sort of you know, to a true, if I could put it that way, a sort of true Garrisonian type contract with hell, burn the Constitution publicly, that kind of thing. Um, sort of a hold on a minute. If 
uh, you know, we're, we can end this institution. And ultimately, if you were to look in post-war, we did end this institution under the authority, you know, of this constitution. So, um, you know, does that sort of put her a little bit more in a position of, um, I'm trying to sort of prick the conscience here in terms of the reality of this document that, um, you know, we, you all say you subscribe to a natural law, natural right position on human beings, but you clearly don't, and it's egregious, it's obvious, uh, and, you know, I, and it, we can uh, use very strenuous language ultimately to point that out. I mean, I, I find her language, if you will, later on, say by the time you get to, um, you, you know, just sort of sticking to the documents we have here, you know, it was about a citizen's right to vote, or even the question of sexual purity, um, and obviously they're not purely, purely dealing with constitutional issues necessarily, um, a, a bit um, softened on that count. Um, and that's something I think students usually kind of pick up on that. Um, and it's, it's quite a time span, obviously. And there's a lot that has happened in terms of the war reconstruction, all these kinds of things that could clearly change someone's viewpoint or maybe soften, or maybe make one think. Hold on, um, uh, you know, not not quite so fast on what this constitution is actually worth uh, in terms of its ability, if you will, you know, understood properly and employed fully to help us, you know, achieve the goals that we want. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, so maybe she never fully came around to the. Uh... I mean, that's exactly what I was thinking of, Will, right? Garrison's, you know, no union with slaveholders. And of course, she's using that phrase as well, the Garrisonian slogan, but she never quite came around to the, in the way Fred Douglas did, where he made the argument that the Constitution, in fact, is anti-slavery, right? It's pro, it's pro freedom. And yeah. it's informed by the principles of the Declaration of Independence, so. I, I would just say simply in terms of uh, touching off a little bit based on your question, what Lauren was saying earlier is that, I mean, I, I do think she has a real sort of rhetorical sense of things as far as how is this going to come across to people. Um, um, you know, for example, when I teach progressives, progressives in terms of this, you know, sort of Wilsonian piety before the constitution. I mean, I'm not trying to draw a direct connection here, obviously, except simply to say that she knows who the audience is out there. I think she's well aware of what was within the frame of the feasible. And um, you can talk about what ought to be. And then, you know, Lincoln on the sort of immediate or even wartime reconstruction, I, you know, you know his, his own party, radicals within his own party. How can you allow this? You know, Lincoln's, uh, you know, estimate of the situation at that point is, you know, Thaddeus Stevens can talk about how things ought to be, but that doesn't mean that there's any way in the midst of a civil war that we're going to be able to make that happen. So I'm working within the realm of the what, what's actually possible here, you know, not, um, and I'm not saying, you know, far be it for me to say somehow that there's this idea that it's not worth putting the ideal out there. I just simply think that there's a movement, uh, if you will, I guess I'll put it that way. Very interesting. Well, uh, you brought up Lincoln. Um, did she have correspondence with Lincoln? Did she meet Lincoln? Beth asks if Anthony pushed Lincoln to remember the ladies toward the end of the war uh, as he began to think about, uh, you know, what was going to what, what the Union would look like after after the end of the war. Do we know? Well, she certainly, yeah, she organized, uh, she was a principal organizer of the um, Loyal League in the midst of the war itself, saying, and I think that was large, I, I don't know if she actually corresponded with Lincoln on that, but the basis of the organization was especially support for the Emancipation Proclamation. I mean, it was especially support for the fact that the administration was doing, you know, if you think about the early document that we had here for these sessions, you know, Lincoln should have done this at the start of the war. You know, you should have put these individuals in, you know, why should all these people be shedding their blood when you could have had an army of however many million, you know, um, you didn't do what you should have done, but, you know, you know, she supported them clearly, uh, at least in that, in that context. 
whether she had direct correspondence with him on that, I'm actually not certain. Yeah, my understanding is that the only thing she, um, she was sort of, um, uh, she voiced her concern to Lincoln about things like the Fugitive Slave Act, but she did not, um, I don't, I don't know if she corresponded with him directly in any way. I don't think she would have had time to, um, uh, given, given his death. So she was still very much focused on abolitionist concerns um, at this time. Uh, and, and I think the, the, the sort of switch to full-blown um, sort of women's issues comes after Lincoln is dead. Okay, great, thank you very much. Uh, again, we have a number of great questions on uh, where, do we, where do we go next? Um, let's see, <laughs> unless there's something that stands out to any of you, feel free to jump There's on. a quick one I can address, just um, Emma asks about her use of the word, the race. Um, yeah, yeah, good. Racial purity. Um, and, and maybe uh, Will can, can point to this too, that the way that the word race is used at this time is um, is a much more universal word than we're used to. So so really, she's referring to the human race. Um, and you see this actually in a lot of um, later progressive era writings um, where people talk about the the race life. And they're talking about sort of the the humanitarian life of people living together in communities. So now we think about it in terms of racial, you know, we've racialized the word um, and, and now associate it with the color of people's skins, but that's not how she's using it. Um, so when she talks about the race being redeemed, she's talking about the human race. Yeah, a perfect point, I think. I was just going to say, if, uh, and you mentioned the score of progressive, something, if you look, for example, at something like Jane Addams in her uh, subjective yeah. necessity of social settlements, she talks about the race life all the time. And yeah. some, some of the language, if you if there's not a familiarity with it, you don't sometimes know what, uh, what what people are talking about, like the use of the phrase helping people actualize their democracy, right? I mean, it's not a common way that we speak of, uh, but that can subsume a lot of things. I mean, um, you know, including we need to actually democratize the political process or something, but yes, the race life um, very broadly, you know, broadly conceived. Yeah. I was also going to say real quickly, just because I was seeing one of the questions there, and Lauren, I think I touched on a little bit earlier, but, um, you know, did, does she express a view, you know, about African uh, American women? Well, if, you know, she, she absolutely, I mean, she incorporates them in the process. She's, the, you know, sort of while we're at it, look, look at how this applies. And I think this is what Lauren was saying earlier with respect to the Constitution. You don't even realize that if, you know, if you, if, if you think it's I'm somehow for one and not the other, or you know it's a horse race here, and uh, you know if you, you, you know, it's kind of this or that, no, I mean of course not. Uh, it's humanity. I mean it's everybody by virtue of their humanity is entitled to this, and again, but but there's a huge sector that isn't you know, benefiting from it, right? Doesn't enjoy it, doesn't enjoy those um, self-evident truths. Yeah, and I just wanna, since since a couple of these questions did um, come up about, uh, again, about the question of racism, um, you know, she also was a very close friend of, um, of Frederick Douglass. She worked very closely with him. She met him, they had a 45 year friendship. She met him when she moved to Rochester, New York. Um, they worked together on a variety of things. They split over the 15th Amendment. Um, but then as soon as that was passed, uh, Douglas came back and worked on, on women's uh, rights issues and, and in particular the, the right to vote. Um, and uh, she accepted his help. Um, and so, and, and they were they were admirers of each other. They were admirers of each other's work. Um, and I believe she actually saw him the day before he died in, in 1895, if I'm remembering this correctly. And when she found out that he died, she was, um, a reporter described her as, you know, she's not someone who, who lets her emotions show, um, but she was very affected by his death. I mean, she was very, um, uh, extremely sad, right? This is someone who she has known and worked with and cared about for, for 45 years. Um, so the, but again, you know, it, it's complicated because of the, the, the kind of conflicts that are going on at the time, even within the women's movement about what to do, um, 
you know, whether to support the, the 15th Amendment as a kind of step forward or whether, um, as Katie Stanton and, and Anthony were concerned, once the 15th Amendment's in place, you're going you're gonna to lose any kind of forward momentum. And they ended up being right. So the criticisms that they were insufficiently supportive of the 15th Amendment as evidence of racism, I just don't think there's any evidence that that is the case. And if you look at Susan B. Anthony's writing in other places, um, she's just very explicit about the need to have, um, to have uh, Black Americans uh, equalized in all of their rights as citizens, right? She's very clear about the, the need to have Black women as part of the movement. She's very concerned about the rights that Black women will have if Black men are granted the right to vote and Black women are not. So again, the idea that there's this binary, I think, is really, we're, we're taking her out of this really complicated historical context um, and sort of holding her to kind of odd, um, it's just, like whether you supported the 15th Amendment or not is not itself evidence of anything, right? Because the 15th Amendment itself was such a complex, um, was in such a complex context. Yeah, I was going to say in terms of this sort of, I'm sorry, Chris, go right ahead there. I didn't no, that. I was just going to say, I'm sorry, Will, uh, Kaylin submitted a, a, a comment, I think essentially trying to say again what you were saying, Lauren, where we're questioning whether the the, the label, labeling people racist at the time isn't a, an application of, of uh, you know, again, our, our own circumstances today that don't necessarily apply because we're not dealing with this. I mean, we're dealing with our own set of complexities and problems, but they're not exactly the same circumstances of the day. So I was just going to say, I think Galen was maybe getting at your point. Yeah. yeah. Well, and just to really, sorry, to really quickly, Jim, I, 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 there are certain people that we can call racist, right? <laughs> like, I mean, if you look at like, you know, the cornerstone speech, right? Like there's certain kinds of documents that are explicitly racist in their thrust, right? But I, I think it's so odd to label Anthony a racist because she worked just tirelessly for abolition and she worked tirelessly for um, for black civil rights. So the, it's just, it's, that one to me is even more odd than, than the sort of blanket statement that we can't judge historical figures. I think we can judge historical figures because some had explicitly racist views, but Anthony is not one of them. And, and she's, you know, again, it's the, the, the context is much more murky, um, but in order, I think, to call her racist, you have to ignore the decades of her life that she spent working hand in hand with abolitionists and with, you know, sort of early civil rights leaders um, on the cause. So, sorry, yeah, Will, you were... for, for my money, there's no, there's no question about whether or not you get a lot of sort of presentist type thinking um, in this respect. I mean, I, I remember having a discussion with a student, very bright, um, uh, but the fact that in at least in one setting, she was sort of concentrating on state legislation to the extent that she was, and, and, and this particular student wondered if that was to the exclusion of any role for the federal government, kind of shading over into um, a state's rights issue, more or less, you know, and, and a, 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 you know, there's a little bit, at least, maybe a lot of, well, I want to be careful about this because, I'm, you know, she has a very singular purpose. And uh, I think, as Lauren said at the outset, there's a true welcoming, I think, of all kinds of people if she believes at the end of the day it helps drive what it is she's trying to accomplish. And I, it's not, I think, you know, sort of, talk about character and persona, I don't think it's part of her to um, turn people away as much as it is to try to convince them, in fact, if she thinks that they're mistaken. But the fact is, is that she's seen success at the state level often enough that there's some focus on state legislature because that's where they're having some success. It's not sort of a, um, you know, if someone wants to have a discussion about Susan B. Anthony on states' rights or, or something like that, that's that's fine. Um, all I'm saying in this instance is this is not someone clearly who thinks there's no no role for the federal government in this. Um, pretty pretty clearly, I, I, I think at the end of the day. But just having said that, it doesn't mean that it, when she sees um, if if she can acknowledge, you know, this state has accomplished this or this state has done it or. Um, you know, as we read in some of the selections here, um, you know, these rights aren't common from a government. 
right? And so I think that's where in, in this particular conversation I was having with the student, that's where some of it was coming from. Of, you know, what, what ultimately does that mean in terms of, uh, well, um, it certainly at the end of the day isn't putting here, I suppose, it, you talk about a self-evident truth, it doesn't put her in a states rights camp if you're sort of, um, you know, uh, you know, sort of cornerstone speech in it. Uh, uh, that's, not, <laughs> that's not who she is, yeah. pretty clearly. Cor cornerstone speech in it. I remember yeah, how's that for a little... As a verb, that's a one word. Alexander Steele, but, <laughs> that's great. But I, I, had, I had to read his explanation of the war. So that's my, that's my revenge. It's the <laughs> densest book I ever read, I ever scanned. <laughs> Matt, by the way, this is this is fun. Uh, Madison, by the way, um, commented that uh, she seems to be sort of lumped in with some of the problematic things that Stanton said about immigrants, African Americans, about voting. Is that a fair uh, assessment? What sorts of things is that a reference to? Is she is she often associated sort of guilty by association, maybe in some people's mind? Well, so I think she's referring to that. Um, there's one particular speech that that Katie Stanton um, gives where she talks about, and this in, in itself is even complicated because it's not clear that Stanton actually believes what she's saying. A lot of, well, at least some historians interpret this speech as her trying to use the language of the anti-immigrant people to show how preposterous their position is, right? Mm -hmm. So, so you're saying all of these people that you don't respect, and she use, and she uses derogatory terms toward um, people of African descent, toward Irish, uh, Italians. Um, but the there are there are historians who say this is a rhetorical move, right? She's saying you think all of these people are essentially sort of human kind of garbage, but you're going to give them the right to vote before you give educated white women from Massachusetts the right to vote. Like this is a very odd position for you to take on your own grounds, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not that Stanton is saying, I feel this way about immigrants, but if you, all you people out there are making these arguments about these immigrants and then saying, well, let's give them the right to vote. That's just a very odd, right? And, and not just the immigrants, right? The um, uh, uh, newly freed, um, uh, folks in the South, you know, her position is that that's just an irrational position, right? Now, if you read it without that broader context of her using the language of the, um, the sort of racist and anti-immigrant folks, it just looks like a straight up racist statement. Mm -hmm. So it's not, again, um, that's, it's a very complicated, and, and this is one of the problems, of course, too, that we have trying to understand the intentions of a lot of these historical figures, um, is that they're they're using rhetoric, right? They're appealing to different audiences in different complicated ways, and so uh, that's why you you get Anthony. Her her message changes slightly based on who she's talking to, mm -hmm. um, and so it's and that's not inconsistency. That's just the the that's activism. That's how activism works. And so um, I do think that, that Madison's correct, that if you lump, if you think that, that Katie, if you use Katie Stanton's comments as evidence of problematic views on race, and then you lump Susan B. Anthony in with her on that, then you look at their objection to the 15th Amendment and you say, oh, well, clearly they're objecting to the 15th Amendment because they're, you know, they're racist. Um, and really, I, I don't, I just don't think that there's actually historical evidence for that. I just think it's a very complicated time where there's lots of people appealing to lots of different complicated constituencies. And somebody um, asked about her relationship with Lucy Stone. Um, and I'll just mention very briefly, because I actually don't know much about their personal relationship, but the Lucy Stone joins Frederick Douglass to support the 15th Amendment. And so that's where you get this fracturing of the, the women's movement. Um, and so Susan B. Anthony and, and Katie Stanton move forward with a different direction, right? Essentially trying to push for, um, for inclusion of women. And Lucy Stone says, no, 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 let's get this done, right? This will be a stepping stone. Um, and I think strategically Lucy Stone was wrong, but looking back, hers was the right position to take. Right? So this is why it's, it's complicated. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, again, like so many other things from the standpoint of studying history, um, one is to, you know, sort of um, immerse yourself in the time, in the language of the time and how people would have understand particular terms and so on and so forth. But another um, by way of problems in the sense is I just, I don't see any way at the end of the day, if you look at, in this case, Susan B. Anthony across the board, her development um, intellectually, her writings, her speeches, her activism, the things she does, um, it's just impossible, I think, to come, you know, to come to a conclusion at the end of the day that I, I, if I think that's what she is, there's something I'm not understanding here. I mean, it would be as though I, you spent, I won't even say your entire adult life, you, you know, you spent, since you were 16 or 17, if not younger, um, misrepresenting yourself or lying to yourself or something, you know, the whole course of your life and everything you've done um, to sort of um, pull one episode or one line out and kind of absolutize that as being the experience of Susan B. Anthony doesn't come to grips with Susan B. Anthony at the end of the day. Um, it, I mean, it. I don't mean it to sound like a throwaway line, um, but on one hand, it is complicated. And on the other, uh, it, it, it requires a lot of you know, of reading, a lot of familiarity with what she has said um, time and again. And, um, and yeah, sometimes the use of a kind of, a, you know, she will reduce things to absurdity sometimes to illustrate, um, you know, wh why the other side is simply wrong or mistaken. I mean, well, okay, the, you know, this is your, like I was referencing earlier about um, teaching. If that's the position you hold, and yet you refuse to, you know, do the other, uh, then, then you're essentially saying that you're not a very smart person, uh, you know, which is it kind of thing, right? Yeah. Nicely put. Thank you both for that. Uh, a lot to think about there. Um, so, um, oh, there was one other question, Lauren, you were uh, talking about a relationship with, um, uh, Lucy Stone, right? And uh, somebody else asked about Alice Paul. Did she, uh, Amanda asked, would she have considered Alice Paul one of her political nieces, as you kind of characterized it earlier, to help keep the movement going forward? I think she would have. I don't think they had contact, or yeah, I, I don't. don't. Yeah, Alice Paul comes later. I think right. if if Anthony had known um, of Paul, I think she would have considered her a, a sort of niece in the movement. Absolutely. Okay. I was going to use that to sort of segue to a larger question about um, sort of Anthony's effect on, on the idea of feminism. Uh, but before they would do that, there are a couple of other sort of maybe follow-up questions <laughs> uh, along the lines of some of the things that you and Will have been focusing on. So um, where was it? Uh, how does Anthony feel about Lincoln's plans for forming the country of Liberia and colonization in, in general? Do we know? If, Will, did you want to? I have a couple oh, of comments. Say, Go ahead. She's being very satirical there, obviously. I mean, in other words, look at the look at the job that we haven't done when we haven't actually brought these principles into full realization. Okay. I mean, wow, you know, the, the massive rate, and I'm just trying to channel a little bit of the satire, you know, for 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 effect here. Wow, we've we got you know, 400 a year, you know, congratulations. Right? In other words, um, I, I think, and Lauren um, may have a different perspective on this, but my, my sense of it is, is that she, you know, she, she basically held to the same kind of views that, you know, I think probably most, and certainly like a Frederick Douglass did on, the, on, on those issues across the board. It's absurd. We're Americans uh, by, by birth. Uh, this is our country. Um, and, uh, you know, this notion, of course, I mean, you know, if you want to talk about something that qualifies in a racist sense, um, certainly as we would see it today, however well-intentioned it may have been, um, you know, you're going to, we're going to, you're going to ship us back. Uh, that, that, that's the plan here. And of course, you don't hear about this much, I, I don't think, um, the actual colonization attempt in, you know, by the Lincoln administration in the midst of the war, which is just utterly disastrous. I mean, you have a mortality rate of about 50 percent. 
um, in the space of 12 months for that group. Um, so, uh, you know, this, there can be no, uh, that, 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 that's just sort of in, in a sort of Frederick Douglass style denunciation, that is an absurdity. If that's supposed to be the solution and the improvement, um, well, cl clearly you haven't really internalized you know, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, you haven't internalized any little rights. Um, I'm, I'm not going anywhere. I mean, I'm, I, I'm not going anywhere. And I think that was pretty much her view of things as well. That's, that, that's you know, absurd. Yeah, I couldn't help it. I'm sorry, Lauren, please. No, go please go ahead, Chris. So I was just, it was slightly tangential. I was just gonna say that, you know, if you have read uh, Fred Douglas's oration in, in memory of Lincoln, he says, you know, Lincoln's shared many of, of the white man's prejudices, right? And I, I think maybe that the thing you were just bringing up was one of those things that I think Douglas thought of. I mean, the prejudice being that Lincoln believed that, that black Americans would be better off not being Americans, right? <laughs> or that they would prefer to not be Americans in light of, you know, in light of the history of slavery and the possibility and probability of continued prejudice. But anyway, I'm sorry, Lauren, please go right ahead. No, she, she does. Um, she explicitly refers to the, the sort of Liberia planet. And I think uh, Will is right on that. She's just she's dismissive of it because it's not like, it, you know, you, you can't just remove uh, the the problem of slavery to to another place but she in in our readings for today um in social purity she actually talks about this and of course this is 1895 so this is later but she talks about this and, and i think this particular section where she's talking about um the uh she says for pure women um it's the paragraph at least i have it as a paragraph that starts it is worse than folly it is madness for women to delude themselves with the idea that their children will escape the terrible penalty of the law um, and then she says for pure women to continue to devote themselves to their man appointed mission of visiting the dark purlieus of society and struggling to reclaim the myriads of badly born human beings swarming there is as hopeless as would be an attempt to ladle the ocean with a teaspoon. And then she goes on to explicitly reference Lincoln's policy with Liberia, right, as well as the Underground Railroad, right? Were these bad things? Well, well, maybe the Liberia one was, but but the Underground Railroad, that's, is that a bad thing? Of course not. But you're ladling the ocean of slavery with a teaspoon. You're, you're just trying to get people out. And so there's actually an interesting I think Anthony's legacy is often, she's often sort of considered one of the more conservative people within the, the sort of, um, certainly the women's suffrage movement. Um, and I think that's actually, a, a, I think that's a mistaking her policy positions for her broader, her broader philosophic commitments. Um, she really is looking for really dramatic social reform. This is not someone who thinks you're gonna, that the vote is, you know, and in fact, originally the vote wasn't even her priority. Uh, she was concerned about these broader structural issues like women's pay and, and, the, and property and contract. So the idea for her is, you know, yes, running the Underground Railroad is great, right? But, but that's, it's a game of whack-a-mole. You're not dealing with the actual structural problem of slavery itself in the same way that the kinds of discussions that, that she, or the kinds of problems she's looking at in terms of women's status and, for example, urban poverty, um, those are not going to be soluble by individual activists going into the slums and trying to rescue one or two kids. That's not how this is going to get solved. It's going to get solved by giving women the right to vote, giving themselves the ability to work and in, in an honest way, um, it's going to give them control over their destiny so that they can, in fact, raise their children without, um, uh, without turning to prostitution. So she's, she really is looking at much, much broader structural reforms than I think we give her credit for. I think a lot of times we sort of focus on the ballot, but she's really looking at a much broader problem. And, and that social purity is a good example of that, that breadth. Yeah, she really is a person, I think, of first principles. I mean, she she goes to the root of it. She goes to the to the root. You know, it's like the poison tree example that, that you know, that that that, uh, that doesn't help. Um, you know, whatever the conversation she had uh, with the, you know, the um, uh, was it sort of the poorhouse um, manager, as I recall. But in any case, um, Tell me, you know, what are what are your numbers? This, the same as they were last year, plus some. OK, I mean, I, I'm. 
I, I'm going for the heart of the matter, and um, you know, you're treating the symptoms. I, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for a cure, uh, and you, you are, you know, you, it, it's fine. I mean, I, I, I mean, I don't think she's saying that's a bad thing, obviously. But she, at the end of the day, which is more important, um, stopping this or treating it? Um, and only so too many people. I mean, again, there's another case I have to say where it just kind of it reminds me of Jane Adams saying. Uh, in subjective necessities, it's, you know, it, it, you want up to a point to deal with this problem, but you don't really want to get at the root of the problem, um, and that's what I'm trying to do, and, and that's, I think, again, one of the sort of, sort of so foundational for her when she deals with the sort of um, natural right aspect uh, up front. You, you, you know, that you're talking about a sort of friendship or a kinship with a Frederick Douglass, you, t you know, you talk about natural right. I have to qu quote a, a British poet to you so you can understand how you haven't really actually lived up to some of the, you know, the fundamental principles of your own revolution. Well, um, there's a lot left undone here, um, you know, not to be redundant on, but for a huge portion of the population, this has not been fully realized sort of a uh, completion of those ideas. And to, that actually segues right into, you know, Heath's question about is she is she blaming the women of the North, right? When she says in, the, in some of those earlier pieces, right? Um, if if you had done what you were supposed to do, right? You would not have to send your, your sons off to the bloody Moloch of war, right? I mean, this is some really tough language. But, but I think she's really clear that if you turn a blind eye to serious injustice, right? If you, if you make accommodations for massive injustice, it will come back, right? There's a kind of natural law element to her, to her thinking. So I think she is in fact blaming the Northern women who, who just were complacent. Um, and they said, well, as long as it's not in our backyard, right? We, it's not our problem, we don't have to deal with it. Um, well, if you do that for long enough, it's, there's, you're going to get some kind of really serious conflict. And the Civil War was the outcome of that, of that complacency. So I think, I think Heath, she is, in fact, um, blaming <laughs> the, northern, uh, the Northern women um, and, and Christian women. And there's kind of echoes of, um, or maybe a pre-echo pre <laughs> of um, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. here, right, in, in her criticism of, the, of Christians. Right, and the role that that Christian people uh, who claim to support Christian values and yet who are allowing and, and working with uh, within slavery as an institution. So she's very critical of um, people who think she thinks have profoundly lost their way morally. Yeah, on that note, I have to say, Lauren, I wondered at times um, as I was going through some of these documents, um, um, letter from Birmingham jail is a cortex that we use, and I'm thinking um you know of of martin, you know, uh, martin luther king jr's uh, you know how long uh how, how long as as she kind of went back and said look we we've, we've been in a war here and of course the war for her is the, in this instance um you know the war over slavery i mean you know um we've had this problem from the start essentially you know she mentions this pirate coming up the james river uh and uh it's just uh i i, I it made me think, you know, King, if, if he wasn't directly thinking about, you know, what she said here, there's certainly huge similarities between the two as far as how long is not getting us anywhere, <laughs> you know, how, I mean, keep, you know, wait, wait, you know, sort of wait, what, you know, sort of wait for what? Yeah, that's great. Great questions. <laughs> great point. So uh, Emma submitted a question that reminded me again, of, I had a larger question about um, Anthony's influence on the idea of feminism or what comes to be known as feminism, especially in the 20th century. So Emma says uh, a running theme and she's pointing, I was interested, I was really interested to read the social purity piece, which I had never read before. But uh, Emma says a running theme throughout social purity seems to be the association of men with depravity and women with virtue. I find this interesting because it's almost as if Anthony is enforcing traditional ideas about female purity, but is instead trying to put an empowering spin on them while simultaneously reversing them to criticize men. I think that's a, that's a very thoughtful uh, observation. Um, and it reminded me of something somebody had asked earlier about um, 
uh, Anthony's uh, language about the power that women have, I think even in the piece on Return to the Old Union, where she talks about the power that women have in their roles as teachers and I think mothers and things like that. So uh, how, how does she shape how we think about, um, just I'll just throw the term feminism out there, but correct me if there's a better way to think about it, please. Any thoughts from either of you on this? <laughs> I know you have thoughts. You guys think a lot and well, but. <laughs> yeah, I, I think she's, I mean, she's a, we, we often, I think there's actually a problem with how we, we study feminism um, in, in sort of the, the sort of history of, of feminist thought. And sometimes we put Anthony into this kind of first wave feminist bucket where the goal is suffrage, right? So it's political rights. And um, I, I, again, I think that that doesn't do enough, uh, it doesn't give her enough credit for the kind of um, breadth of the problems that she's, she's looking at. Um, the incision of her thought in terms of how deep these issues go and what kinds of things are, are going to be, um, what kinds of changes are going to be necessary. Um, as Emma points out, though, I mean, she's, she's at least in these writings, she is a what, what is often called a difference feminist, where she's, she's very much aware that men and women have different natures. Um, and she's, she's both playing with this kind of concept of the, um, you know, the sort of Victorian concept of women having this sort of pure moral nature. And um, but she's using it, as Emma points out, in a kind of subversive way to say, well, this is the problem, right? So women have this, uh, this sort of pure nature, but then you take away their ability to defend that nature, and then you put them in the most degrading kinds of situ, you force them into the most degrading kinds of occupations. She's, she's very critical, obviously, of prostitution. Um, and, uh, and, and so she says, well, what we want is actually an equality, right? So this is at the end of, of social purity where she says, you know, if we want to put women in a situation where they can choose to make, they, they can be true moral agents. And then if they end up in, in prostitution, we can blame them as much as we blame men, right? So as opposed to pitting them, we can condemn them like we condemn men. Um, but so, so there's, there is a kind of, emphasis of the different social and moral natures of, of men and women, but she's using that difference to, to cement the political and, and civil equality that she thinks women need in order to live up to that, um, uh, to that moral sort of um, standard. And this is echoed later. I know we mentioned Jane Addams and there's, there's a couple other, um, you know, progressive thinkers who, who later really take a lot of these ideas and, and, pull them even further by pointing out that we need to sort of feminize um, politics. We need to uh, bring in more of the kind of nurturing that women do, right? Politics up until this point had, has been a, a man's game. And now we need to feminize politics and bring in nurturing and caring and all the things that women do. Uh, so that, that I think is, is very characteristic of both this time and also the kinds of arguments that, that Anthony is making. And then later feminism starts getting into really in the sort of 60s and 70s, you start seeing the sort of androgyny feminism move in where men and women are just the same, right? It's all differences between the, the sexes are social constructs. Um, Anthony is not there, right? But at the same time, she's playing with these social constructs. She chooses not to get married. She chooses not to have children because she understands what that will do to her ability to do the work that she cares about. And she's, she's critical in some later writings about, um, critical in a concerned way, about how um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton's, um, you know, she has seven children. Uh, I think she has more pregnancies. I think she loses a few of those. Um, but her pregnancies and the number of children that she had really limited her ability to travel. It ruined her health. I mean, she had a lot of serious health issues as a result of just subsequent pregnancies. Um, and, and Anthony is, there's trade-offs, right? She's, these are, she's looking at her good friend and watching how motherhood has, um, it's both a blessing and it, it comes with some serious uh, limitations for women at that time. A sort of rambling answer, but oh, that's very thoughtful. That helps. It was a good helps. rambling. I, I uh, just um, was thinking uh, more when you're commenting there. Um, she uh, again, I like the idea of kind of utilizing that notion. Um, she's not effacing. She's not wiping away a kind of difference in nature. 
uh, aspect. But at the same time, I always think about her in terms of sort of a Frederick Douglass, um, not exclusively, but particularly kind of a post, you know, post-war, maybe even post-Reconstruction Douglass, where he isn't quite put it in so many words, but he uh, effectively says, um, stop noticing the fact that I'm black. It doesn't have anything to do with what ultimately I merit as a human being. Um, and when you, know, when you do that, then you create a basis already for um, treating me differently somehow, right? Well, I'm not saying she's saying that with respect to gender in this instance, but I do think, you know, Chris, you're talking about the broader impact, the big, the big impact, and that is, is that there are, uh, you know, because I had a student ask me based on some of these readings before, does she, does she dislike man? I said, no, she doesn't dislike man. Uh, you know, she, is there a one size fits all for her, for women and men? No, she calls things as she sees them. Either you get it on these first principles or, or you don't. And I think that's what she's striving for. And that's what I think she does so much to me anyway, for authentic feminism is to say, if this has to be mainstreamed in terms of natural law, natural right. Um, you, uh, you, you're going to have to, I don't want to sound cliche about a paradigm shift, but you're going to have to start thinking differently across the board on these kinds of things um, until you can internalize this idea and this notion. Um, um, then we're going to continue to have these kind of, um, you know, inequities in our in, a, in our society, whether it's women or whether it's, um, you know, um, African Americans, whatever the case, you know, whatever the case may be. Yeah, thank you both for that. That, that that's very helpful. Uh, provides a nice framework for how to go about thinking about this this big question. So we're down to our last two or three minutes. Um, so I'll try to ask. I think maybe some shorter questions or some questions that might merit shorter answers. Uh, Chava asked, why did uh, Stanton, not, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Anthony not attend the Seneca Falls Convention? Or is that a long story? Do we know? No, I think it was just her sister. I think her sisters attended. I think she okay. just didn't, I don't think she knew it was gonna be as important as it okay. was. People, <laughs> people she knew, people she knew went and, uh, you know, I, I don't think there was a, a any drama. <laughs> Yeah, I don't, I, I don't, uh, I'll just say, at least I'll just say to my knowledge, I don't know of a backstory there. Um, yeah. I mean, I kind of go with kind of a, I remember uh, Alice Tyler in her work on, you know, 19th century reform, basically, uh, you know, that there was a certain kind of, um, you know, there's a locality aspect about it. I mean, kind of word of mouth gets out and, uh, you know, nobody really expects there to be much, you um, I don't want to say to it, but this, it's not going to draw a big crowd. It's not necessarily going to yield up something as significant as it ultimately does. You know, you know no, nobody has foresight into the, um, you know, the declaration and the impact of it ultimately. And uh, you, you get a lot of locals that turn out. It turns into a bigger event locally than I think probably the organizers of it even anticipated. But I don't think there's any kind of, um, at least that I'm aware of, sort of thought where she's concerned about, here's a reason why I'm just not yeah. gonna go. That's true. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and okay, I really, I know we're down to the last minute too, but, but I'm, I just can't resist. Um, do we know what her views were on Woodrow Wilson and his, um, what do we call it? Hesitation, resistance? Beth asked this question to the 19th Amendment. I don't think we do. I mean, she dies in 1906, so this okay, is so this is before she, she knew about him right. as as president. Um, but uh, I assume she would have found him obnoxious before what that too. <laughs> yeah, what her views would have been of those yeah. obnoxious. Well, yeah, if I can jump in real quick and just answer Heath, I think Heath's question um, is a good one, just about why there was yes. so much fear about giving women the right to vote. Yeah. And I really do think that it 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 really has to do with concerns about marriage and the family. And so the family as this sort of foundational institution of civil society, it's really seen by many, if not most people at the time as the glue that kind of holds society together. And I think there was enormous fear that if women had the right to vote, there would be 
it would, they would make divorce easier. Um, they would, you know, demand all sorts of things within the context of marriage. Of course, that's what ends up happening. Um, but that is, I think, the I think the fear of what will happen to marriage is one of the biggest fears of the of suffrage for women. That's great. That's very helpful. Good. Um, again, maybe one. Well, two two quick questions. No, one more question. Uh, uh, people like to uh, ask about books, suggested reading, further reading. Um, and uh, uh, Timothy is especially interested in if you know of any biographies that that look at uh, Susan B. Anthony in the context of her historical in the historical context of her time, as you were both describing it earlier. So, do you have some further reading uh, that you can recommend? I think Jeff Ward uh, has, uh, you know, I, I, while I don't agree with every aspect of the work, but, you know, that's just the nature of the historical enterprise. Very seldom do you, I think, read a 350 or 400 page book and say, well, yeah, everything there. Um, but <laughs> in any case, I think there's um, a, a lot on that to be gleaned from the, it's Jeff, Jeffrey with a G, um, Ward, uh, Jeffrey Ward. Um, uh, it's not purely, you know, Susan B. Anthony, but it's, um, oh, uh, I'm trying to think of the title of it. Jeffrey Ward will pull it up for you. Um, but I think that um, speaks to some of what he's asking about. Thank you. I would also recommend, um, it's it's a bit outdated, but I think there's still a lot of really good stuff in there. Um, Eleanor Flexner's work, The uh, Century of Struggle, the, the Women's Rights Movement in the United States, um, she was one of the first sort of historians to put that together. I think it came out in, in 1960, so it's, it's older. Um, but she, I think, does a nice job of looking at the, the sort of competing strands within the women's movement. And of course, Anthony is, is a big part of that. Um, and I don't know of any modern biographies of, of Anthony, and I should, so. <laughs> okay, well, thank you, though. That's good, good suggestions. Thank you both very much. And I really appreciate your time this morning and your thoughts. Uh, this has been a very helpful way to start to take in uh, a figure as, as, as large uh, in the sense of importance as, as Susan B. Anthony. So thank you again, both very much. Really appreciate yes. it. This was fun. Thank, thank you for you the guys. wonderful well, questions, fun. everyone. Yeah, very good. Yeah. yeah, we had more great questions and I apologize. I, I just didn't, we couldn't squeeze them all in, but there were some really great questions on the table still. But uh, food for further thought perhaps on another occasion. So uh, just a reminder to everybody about the email that you'll receive with your link for your certificate of participation. And if you've enjoyed our conversation today, uh, I encourage you to look into the other resources that um, tah.org provides. You can go to the websites. Um, uh, we have other free webinars um, and seminars um, on a variety of topics. So you can also help us spread the word about our, our programs and our resources by sharing the archive link that you'll receive in the email um, and uh, tell your colleagues about it, post about it on social media and anything else you feel like doing. So within reason, of course. Our next webinar will be Saturday, April 10th, and we'll be having a discussion about uh, Fannie Lou Hamer. So that'll be interesting as well, I'm sure. Until then, take care. See you next month. Thanks. Thanks again for listening. You can learn more about our free programs, resources, and documents collections at teachingamericanhistory.org or tah.org.